Thank you everyone for attending. And I'd like to thank the town for arranging this forum. I'm Deputy Chief Chip Nanko of the Hartsdale Fire District. To start off tonight, I'll be giving a quick overview of fire prevention in the community and in the fire service. Then Captain Jim Malone of the Fairview Fire District and Lieutenant Mark Bendel of the Greenville Fire District will give a presentation narrowing down tonight's fire safety topics. When we speak about fire prevention, we need to consider the roles of the community and the fire departments and the basics that lead us to effective fire prevention programs. Education, preparation, and recognition are three of the things that lead us to prevention programs and practices. Here's some suggestions what the community can do. With education, the number of topics to cover for fire prevention is vast. We would never be able to cover all the topics in one night. We need more forums like this, if possible, Paul, uh, that are designed to address a specific topic that we can discuss in detail. Another suggestion is get to know your fire departments. Get to know the fire departments in your area. Call them up, ask, their, ask questions. I know it's difficult with COVID to go visit because visiting um, has been restricted due to COVID in certain departments. But anytime you have the opportunity, there are virtual meetings once a month with the districts and in the villages for their boards. Participate, get to know who your firemen are and what your fire districts and your fire departments are. Do you know if they're volunteer? Do you know if they're combination? Do you know if they're career? Find out all of these things. Then ask them, what programs do they have? And do they have community outreach that can help you in the educational process? Preparation. Once you do these things and you start getting some education, you're gonna learn some things during uh, PowerPoints and presentations that you're gonna to wanna to bring home and you wanna to bring to your office. You're gonna learn about removing hazards. You're gonna learn about installing smoke and carbon monoxide detectors that work. You're gonna talk about pathways clear to exits. You're gonna learn about planning and knowing two ways out of your home and any meeting place you are in. This is all part of the preparation that helps. The acts and the education now can lead you to recognizing hazards and recognizing when you need to call emergency services. The saying was, see something, say something. Well, for the fire service, we like to add, see, smell, and hear something, say something. Do not delay. If there's an alarm sounding, do you smell natural gas? Is there a door that is usually closed that should be closed, like what happened in the Bronx, the tragedy in the Bronx? Tell somebody. Notify us, give us a phone call. We would rather come and investigate to make sure everything's okay than come too late when it's, the situation has gotten worse. Please do not think that someone else has made the call. If you see, smell, or hear something, you make that phone call. Because a lot of times everyone always thinks somebody else did it and they didn't. So please make those phone calls. Early detection and early notification starts the emergency response system. And response times, as we'll learn, are very critical. So you have all of this in place now. You are taking your knowledge, your awareness, what you attain during the education step. You've adjusted your lifestyles in and out of your home to accommodate getting rid of hazards and improving your lifestyle. Recognizing and notifying without delay the emergency response system, that is the key to fire prevention. The biggest part of it though, is now you must maintain it. Making sure that the awareness level you have attained, the precautions and changes you put in place continue and are functioning as they should be. That would be helpful for us from the community. Now, what does the fire department do for fire prevention? 
Well, like community education, we have intensive and extensive training. I know the departments represented here are collectively thousands of hours above the required training for firefighters per year per man. Public education programs we offer. We offer home inspections. We offer school visits. We offer, we offer babysitters programs to teach young adults life skills. We offer au pair programs to teach them about fire safety. We have car seat inspection and installations. We have CPR and first aid classes. We have smoke and carbon monoxide detector installations. And we have building presentations. If you live in a multiple dwelling, we do have fire prevention and safety presentations that we will do specific to your building and your needs. We also, and this is working with the town, we do building and safety inspections for the town of Greenberg. Our members inspect all multiple dwelling and public assemblies, along with commercial properties. And we are looking for safety and maintenance hazards that are in violation of the New York State Building Code. If we do find them, we write up a violation notice, and then we allow the town to know that this is happening. And if they don't get corrected, the town can then send their inspectors to visit to try and correct any violations. This is a collaborative effort with the fire departments in the town of Greenberg. Also these inspections serve as training for the firefighters. So they are familiar with the buildings in their response areas. These inspections allow the firefighters to walk through the buildings, get to know every nook and cranny and get to know where all the hazards are. So if you have a firefighter responding to your building, it's not the first time he's going or she is going in there. We also have mutual aid and automatic aid agreements with our neighboring departments. We try to make sure we have the proper amount of trained firefighters responding to mitigate any emergency at hand. Back to response times. We mentioned that they're critical. Making sure our response times are reduced by having your firefighters, equipment, and gear ready to respond in seconds. Delays in response lead to bigger emergencies. Fire doubles in size every 30 seconds, especially with new construction materials being used. This is one of the reasons that early notification from the community is extremely important. The reduced response times enable us to protect lives, prevent damage, and reduce any further loss that may incur. So what does all this mean? This is all about risk reduction. With all of the factors in place, it still does not eliminate fires and hazardous conditions. Mechanical system errors, outages, human error, and intentional human acts such as arson will always mean the risk still exists. But with prevention measures taken by the community and the fire service, we hope to significantly reduce the risk. So that was the overview. I would now like to turn the program over to Captain Jimmy Malone and Mark Ben and Lieutenant Mark Bendel to go over the PowerPoint. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Evening, everyone. Um, I'm gonna share my screen now and a brief PowerPoint, but essentially it's going to cover some very basic safety concerns that a lot of people don't uh, truly understand. So there are some safety tips that we can give you that will drastically increase your chances of survival and the protection of your own homes and belongings uh, through this PowerPoint. Okay. So we have a term, uh, it's titled Edith, close before you doze, and that will make a little bit more sense in a moment. Um, but first, I uh, just want to touch on the purpose. So the purpose for tonight was to review the recent fire incidents with tragic and potentially preventable outcomes. Uh, we're going to discuss the hazards present during fire incidents, provide fire safety information to residents and visitors of the town of Greenberg, and at the end, we'll answer any related questions following the presentation. First up, I just wanted to cover the fatal Bronx fire on January 9th. 
the cause of the fire is uh, attributed to a space heater malfunction. Uh, unfortunately, there were 17 lives lost, including eight children. And additionally, there were 32 life-threatening injuries, which is really important um, because that absolutely could have been prevented. And some of the contributing factors here included uh, bypass self-closing doors to exit stairwells, to resident apartments, and open windows. On top of that, uh, we had the fatal Philadelphia fire not too uh, long before. The cause of that was attributed to a Christmas tree ignited by a juvenile with a lighter. 12 people lost their lives, including eight children, and two additional people were listed in critical condition. So when speaking about the contributing factors to loss of life and fire spread for both incidents, uh, a lack of working smoke detectors is probably the most important one. Without early notification, of a potential fire in your building or home, uh, you may sleep right through it and never know. Bypassing safety features, such as self-closing doors in common areas of apartment buildings and hallways and exit stairwells is detrimental to the fire safety of everyone involved. Um, it's gonna allow for smoke to uh, move freely throughout the building and potentially overcome those trying to get out. Rapid fire spread due to open doorways uh, throughout the residence. Unfortunately, um, when the doors are left open and windows are left open, it's going to essentially feed the fire and make it more intense. So as to DC Nagel's point, fires uh, grow every 30 seconds. They double in size. That's going to drastically increase the growth of the fire. So at this point now, I'm going to give this up to uh, Lieutenant Bendel, and he's going to review the Close Before You Doze initiative. Uh, we have a video here. I'm hoping it plays over the, um, over the Zoom. If not, I do have a link listed at the end. So if anyone wants to view it, if there's any technical difficulties, they may do so at the end uh, with the link provided. Good evening, everybody. Can you, uh, am I talking? Can everybody hear me? Yep. Good. So, so the initiative here that we're talking about is, um, is kind of this cool rhyme, close before you doze. Um, and it kind of bodes to, to two parts of this. First and foremost, um, in an apartment building, closing the door to your apartment, and then within your apartment or within your home, closing the door to your bedrooms before you go to bed. Um, like Captain Malone said before, leaving doors open gives fire a pathway to travel throughout a structure. Um, one thing that we see now is our, our homes are loads of fuel. Um, things are made from, from plastic and other um, hydrocarbon type materials. They burn hotter and faster than, um, than traditional wood and organic materials did um, in the past. Um, if you look at the video screen here, a fire was lit in the two different units. On the left-hand side, the bedroom door was closed and on the right-hand side, the bedroom door was left open. Obviously we can see a, a tremendous difference in fire damage. And it's important to note here that <clears throat> it's not just fire and burns that hurt and kill occupants of these homes. It's toxic gases and carbon monoxide, the byproducts of, of the burning materials. Um, and one thing from the Close Before You Doze campaign, um, just a quick note on numbers here, an open door can mean 1000 parts per million of carbon monoxide in the room that's being affected by fire and smoke. And with the closed door, it's 100 parts per million. That means that um, with a proper exit plan, the room with the door closed is survivable for the occupants. If we want to try playing the video now, Cap. Got it. All right. Does everybody have the uh, have the video oh. here? It's about a five and a half yeah. minute video. Oh my gosh. That is insane. In the event of a fire, who here thinks that you're safer sleeping with doors open? I keep them open because I was mom for so long. My kids' room is two doors down from mine, always open. I'm not all that confident they would stop anything anyway. Harold, hey. Ben, Ben, nice to meet you. Harold, have a seat. Hi. 
Discussion, but what we didn't tell you is that there is also a demonstration that we want to show you. Sound good? And I want you to see how this looks like your home. And then once we get you outside, we're going to go ahead and recreate what would happen if there was a fire in this structure right here. Look pretty normal. Yeah, got some furnishings. You'll notice the difference down here. As we walk down, this bedroom door will be closed. And the one at the end of the hall will be open. And what I want you to do is pay attention to comparison to the two of those and think about you and your family trying to survive this fire. All right, we just hit the button. We have ignition. Oh, boy. There she goes. Oh, man, that is scary. It's scary. Yeah. Look, we have some smoke coming out over here. Smoke's coming out. <gasps> what a lot of people don't realize is that the furnishings that are in our homes today are made of synthetic materials. So they burn so much faster than your old natural cotton filled furnishings used to be. The statistics that we've seen through our research is in about 40 years ago, you had about 17 minutes to get out of your house after the smoke alarm sounded. Now you have less than three minutes. Crap, see this is what we're, this is the things that we were. Feel that? How can you survive that? Seriously, that is insane. All right, go ahead, knock it down. All right, as you remember, closed door on the left, open door on the right. You can see the dramatic wow. difference between the two with the simple closed door. We want people to be as prepared as possible and understand the importance and how little time you have and what that simple barrier can provide to you and your family should you have a fire. I want you guys to throw some hard hats on and some safety glasses and at least poke your heads in the windows or you can even walk in the hallway if you want. Give me a word or phrase to describe what you just saw. Anxiety. Frightening. Terrifying. I really didn't expect anything like this. Now I'll ask you one last time. In the event of a fire, are you safe for sleeping with the doors open or the doors closed? Without a doubt, the door closed. Definitely with the doors closed. And from now on, the doors will be shut at night. <laughs> Definitely closed. Closed. Definitely closed. And I'm surprised by it. It's always great to be able to get the message out. When we can take our research and get it out into the community to change behavior with the message of close before you doze, it, it feels great. And hopefully we can save lives. If there was one bit of advice that you could give friends or family today, what would it be? Close before you doze. 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 The key fire safety messages we want people to have are, one, have working smoke alarms in every level of your home, inside and outside every sleeping room. We want everybody to have an escape plan. Should you have a fire, you should know how to get out quickly. And if you can't get out quickly, having a closed door between you and where that fire is is critical to your survival.
try to unshare my screen here and then it was worth the wait. There we go. And then pull that PowerPoint back up. We'll continue. <laughs> it's important here too to note. It's important here to note too that if you are trapped in your apartment or in a, a bedroom behind a door, we are trained um, to find you. Our job is to rescue you. Um, we have two fights in this. We have to fight the building, right? The building can help spread the fire and we have the fight for life. And, um, and for us, you know, the fight for life is, is, is very important. That's why we're here. In terms of uh, the closed doors, um, is that something that the department inspects? That, and that really all depends. I'll, I'll defer to you, uh, Deputy Chief Nanko. Uh, it all each building uh, for common areas. If we if we're looking at um, doors that close, self close, they usually for stairwells. Um, we have to make sure if they have fire service doors that they are inspected every year and that they do close when they're supposed to. The individual doors, apartment doors, by code for um, Greenberg are not required. This is a New York City code in the Bronx that required apartment doors to be self-closing. So we, we don't inspect people's, um, as they say, their castles unless invited. So uh, those doors, they don't have to be self-closing. We just have to make sure that they're in good main, maintained condition and that's all. But stairwell doors, we do write up. If they, we test them, we open them, we swing them open and then we make sure they close fully if not it gets written up we address it with the um, supers and we try and get them to fix those as quickly as possible do you recommend that we do what new york city does and uh, require um, the doors to uh, uh, close in in all uh, apartment buildings and you know could this be done retroactively and um, how expensive is it oh uh, well it would be outrageously expensive <laughs> you would have to talk to the management companies about that for the every single door that would be need to be made um self-closing uh, i don't know the numbers on that but i can imagine that most of them aren't uh, so that would be an expense that the management company would have to deal with the main thing is that people keep them closed when there's a fire of uh, when they leave their building if they're or they're leaving their uh, apartment. We want them to leave the door unlocked, but just make sure it's closed behind them. So if we can do it through outreach and educational, I think that is our first step of towards making sure that the tragedy is uh, lessened here. It's never going to be fully, as I said before, you can't get rid of the whole risk. There's always going to be a human factor. There's always going to be a malfunction. But um, in this case, it's uh, if you wanted to look into it and research it, uh, but you would have to talk to the management companies and see how many of these doors would have to be transferred over to self-closing hinges. Thank you. So some of the other stuff that we're looking at here, um, we want to make sure there's at least one working smoke detector present on each level of each home. Um, preferably we want them in every bedroom outside of the bedrooms and on every level and near, um, you know, appliances that can produce carbon monoxide, um, as well. Um, we want, and ideally a monitored, um, fire alarm system of some sort in every home. Um, if that's possible is great. Um, because if the person's out of the home or if the person is not able to, to make the call, the automatic alarm is that, that fail safe point. Um, <clears throat> sheltering in place um, in some of our larger buildings and some of our larger apartment buildings, the safest place to be might be right where you are. Um, if the fire is on a different floor and it's not affecting your area um, and you don't have to walk down past where we are working and where the, um, the, the byproducts of the fire are, you might be safe staying exactly where you are. And that's something we would guide our, our residents on um, during the incident. Um, never leave supplemental heating appliances unattended. Space heaters um, of any sort um, should not be left on while you're out of the house. They, they should be closely guarded while you're in the house if you're using them. 
And it's really important here to get, um, to, to get good quality appliances, um, you know, from a reputable source, source. Um, preferably something that is uh, tested and endorsed by underwriters laboratories. That's kind of the benchmark of safety. Um, another trend that we're seeing, um, lithium ion batteries, especially in electric scooters, um, when they're left unattended to charge, they could spontaneously catch fire. It, it's happening um, a lot in New York City. And, um, you know, we, we, we see that these batteries start um, fires on upper floors of, of apartment buildings. They can start on fire in elevators. And um, other times when, they, when these batteries are burning, they create a hazardous materials incident as well and require cleanup. Um, in addition to what happens with the fire. Um, <clears throat> you know, our biggest thing here is prevention and making sure that our homes are, are safe before any of this ever happens. Um, part of that is planning your exit from your home, coordinating with your family. And um, the, the acronym we use is called EDITH, Exit Drill in the Home. And uh, Captain Malone is gonna take that over and explain uh, what we recommend on, on that front. Thank you, Lieutenant. Uh, so as I said earlier, we had that phrase in the beginning, Edith, close before you doze. It's just one way for us to remember both of these initiatives. Uh, Edith was something that and the NFPA uh, released. They're kind of the guiding standard for pretty much everything fire service related. So exit drills in the home. It sounds simple, but this is something that not a lot of people do. Uh, we teach children in schools uh, to know where they're supposed to go in the event of a fire alarm, regardless of if they're in their classrooms or they're in the hallways, they know where to go. And it's incredible that schools can evacuate an entire facility in sometimes two minutes or less. So there's really no reason that we can't do the same thing in our own homes. And anytime that we go and give public education programs to any of the students in the uh, schools in our first in areas, we tell them, or at least I certainly do, I tell them, you know, I want to send you home with some homework. And sometimes we'll give out forms like the one that's on the screen now. Uh, there are many like it. It's not just this one, but I say it's fun homework. It gives them something to do to bring back to their families to practice they should always know two ways out they should know the hazards in the house they should know where their meeting place is going to be whether that be a driveway a mailbox a large tree uh, they should know never to go back in for anything once they've left uh, a lot of these things is, it, it sounds very very simple but in the heat of the moment when things are going wrong a lot of people forget these things. So the more you practice these uh, exit drills in the home with your family members, the more it becomes second nature. Uh, so like I said, have a meeting place, know before you go, very important. Where am I gonna go? What are my two ways out? Sometimes two ways may not be enough and you may have to shelter in place like we spoke about earlier. Uh, for that, uh, you need to make sure that you feel the doorways. We tell the children and anyone we teach uh, about exiting, always make sure you feel the door with the back of your hand. There's less nerve endings there, so it's less that you can hurt. Feel the door at the back of your hand, start at the bottom and work your way up. If the door is hot, you shouldn't be going out that way because your egress is probably cut off. Never pop any doorways open. Never use elevators during potential fire events. Uh, by code, elevators should recall in the event that a fire alarm is activated. So they should recall down to the bottom floor and be inoperable. If that doesn't happen and the elevator is still operating, you should never get in it. So you should always be trying to use an exit stairwell in a multiple dwelling uh, for uh, exit from upper levels. And never go back inside once you're exited. Uh, don't go back for family members. Don't go back for belongings. I know that sounds difficult. If you have a loved one inside, you're going to want to go back in. But truth be told, if they're safe where they are and their egress was cut off, but yours was not, you're going to be the best source of information for us once we get on scene to know exactly where to go.
whether we have to put a ladder up to a second or third floor. Um, but you're going to be the best source of information for their last known location if they're not outside with you. So it's a very important thing. Do we have questions from the public? Just a moment. So just um, putting it out there on behalf of the chiefs, officers, and firefighters of Fairview, Hartsdale, and Greenville Fire Departments, we like to thank everybody for taking the time to listen to this presentation and hope it was informative and just gives it a little new outlook on fire safety, something to bring home with your family and friends uh, for a healthy and safe new year. This is really fantastic. We'll create a YouTube and um, distribute it to uh, and, and widely share it. And I think that um, periodically we should be um, doing whatever we can to remind people the importance of um, fire safety. But this was very, very informative. And you know, I really appreciate uh, you taking the time to educate us. Well, thank you, Paul. Um, just to clarify, as far as that code goes, you do have the existing buildings, but it, nothing stops you from new construction, updating your codes. So, but that's, you want to still want to talk to management companies to see what the, the costs are on that. If you are doing new construction and it's something you want to require for new construction. Right. So, um, okay. So we would, ba so basically right now for the existing buildings, people don't have to have the, these doors, um, you know, in, in, at their apartments, but for only, it's only for the stairwells. For common area doorways. Yes. Right. And in terms of, um, so you would recommend that maybe we look at legislation that would require it for um, any new construction. New construction, but I would still investigate um, just to find out exactly with the management companies, how many doors are already self-closing. If I'm correct, I think High Point is self-closing doors. Um, so there might be areas already with them, but you might want to just uh, have a meeting with all management companies to talk about, or we can all join you with the management companies to sit there and talk about fire hazards in these buildings. And that could be addressed as one of the topics. That would be, uh, you know, that would be um, terrific. Do you have, uh, we have a list of management companies and you deal with, you do annual inspections there, right? Correct. So maybe we could just work together with the fire departments and, and the town and, and indicate that, you know, we want to make sure that these type of tragedies don't happen here in Greenberg. And maybe we could be proactive and the town board could um, consider taking some action and you know, working with them. Do you know if there's any grants that are available to retrofit doors? You know, that is there like a, a state program where they would encourage um, uh, buildings to become safer? Uh, not that I'm aware of, but in your position and considering this topic is very much uh, a hot topic at this point with what happened in the Bronx, you might be able to now partition, um, uh, petition some politicians in Albany to start looking into it and maybe offer some type of grants to try and do it. But that'd take a lot of research. Okay, we'll definitely work on that. And thank you. Any, does anybody else from the public have any questions? We have no raised hands. Uh, I have a question. Uh, obviously, you know, we could ask the management company, but it may be that somebody who lives in an apartment uh, and has an actually fire, fire rated entrance door to the apartment. Uh, is there something they could do themselves if they wanted to go out and get a device to put on the door? Uh, if, you know, it might not be the top of the line, but you know, something is better than nothing at this point to see whether or not they uh, could have some kind of a spring to close the door if they wanted to do that, or is that not recommended? Um, there are things out there. There are changes of hinges that can help you make it self-closing. Um, I think there are also some uh, smaller items that make a, a door, usually a lighter weight door, self-closing. But that would all depend on the construction of the apartment building, what type of doors, and how easy that is to do. Um, now, and it also would depend probably on the rules of the apartment building, what they're allowed to alter and what type of construction they can change. 
Right. Well, I think after what's been happening in recent events, uh, it would be hard pressed for the management company to say you can't do something to make it self-closing. But um, I understand what you're saying. It probably should come from the uh, management company and be universally applied. I have a question. You know, maybe we could all. Do you, I have a question, Paul. Do you recommend to homeowners that they have an electrical analysis done on their homes and every so many years, every two decades or three decades, is there a time frame within which or after which um, homeowners should say, I, I think you know, it's time to have a, um, an, an analysis done on our electrical uh, wirings. Um, well, right now there are some buildings that you know, due to their age, of uh, they were of uh, wired uh, what was appropriate at that time. Now what we have is we're seeing that three wire grounded GFIs are all uh, recommended and upgrading from some places still have aluminum wiring upgrading to copper, updating the box to make sure you have enough amperage coming into your house to accommodate everything that gets plugged in now. So the best thing I can tell you is if you have an outlet that only has two sockets to plug in and not a three prongs, then it's time for you to upgrade your, <laughs> upgrade your, um, your electrical, have it researched. Uh, you're looking for any type of uh, outlet that has a ground, you want that to be there. So if you have anything before that, if you see any wiring that has the cloth insulation on it, if you see aluminum wiring, it's probably time to get your uh, electrical updated or inspected. I don't know if the other guys have any other uh, tips on that. Yeah, I, I would just go ahead and recommend that if you're doing a... Um any kind of upgrades to your home, any kind of renovation, when you do that area of the home, um, you know, definitely upgrade the electrical right then and there. And if you have a licensed uh, professional electrician there, have them check your panel, have them check the rest of your residence as well. Um, it can't hurt to know that you are either going to need to upgrade at a certain point or should upgrade at the present time when you're doing a home renovation. Thank you. I have a question. Um, for those, for new homes or for older homes, they're, the outlets, they only have like, sometimes they have one outlet per room. Is it now a standard to have two outlets or four on each wall? I remember seeing that someone was telling me that a long time ago. I just don't know, is that still the standard or was that ever a standard? That was just something they were thinking of. <laughs> so for each bedroom, you should have at least two outlets on one side of each wall. Is that a standard or is that not a standard? Or is that something they should be looking forward to? Because there's a lot of older homes and as you relate, as you just mentioned about the upgrading and the wiring and making sure that you have a three prong instead of a two prong outlet. Is there anything as it relates to how many outlets should be per room? So I think the, the best answer for that is uh, I would contact a, a licensed electrician to talk about that because it's not just about adding an outlet your service coming in has to be able to support the load that's being called for from appliances. And if we're being honest, everything this day, these days is getting plugged in. Everything's battery operated, everything's charged, everybody's always connected. So it's not just about um, adding another outlet. But you have to make sure that that electrical panel, the service coming into your home and the breakers or fuses are sized correctly to meet that demand. I guess the concern also I have too is when people overload a an extension cord because there's not enough outlets in the room. So that's why. Yeah, I'll just that's jump on that. Oh, go ahead, sorry, Jim. No, okay. in, a, in a previous jurisdiction that I worked in, we had college dorms and that was a, a really big issue when we did inspections, um, overloading power strips. Um, you know, and this is a point where I'll, I'll also say, make sure you buy power strips and extension cords if you're going to use them. Um, that can handle the electricity that the end product can handle. Um, the, the stuff from the, the discount stores does not 
um, handle anything reliably. And, you know, that, that can be um, the cause of a catastrophe. Have you had space heater related problems, you know, fires, you know, in, in the town? Nothing we have had I them. Think of. Yeah. Um, we just had a, a commercial incident the other day where we, we stopped a commercial occupancy from using space heaters that could have resulted in, in a fire. Just to build on that, um, any electrical wiring that you use that's supplemental, such as extension cords or um, power strips, you want to make sure if you're using a power strip that it has a built-in GFI on it. You want it to be able to have a breaker that it can trip. That's that's what uh, a surge protector. It's going to protect your uh, your belongings. And as far as extension cords go, honestly, the rule of thumb, the safest way to go is to make sure that what you're getting is third party tested. And as Lieutenant Bendel said earlier, UL Underwriters Laboratory. That's basically the accepted standard or gold standard, if you will, that um, is a third party organization that tests these electrical items. So. You want to make sure that you're buying something quality. Um, and as far as the uh, space heaters go, there are a lot of new products out there that are actually really great. It's cold. We're going to be in the teens the rest of this week. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, your, your baseboard heating, your forced air, it's just not really cutting it and you have a chill in you. It's okay to have space heaters, but they have a lot of great safety products that are out there now that, for instance, if someone knocked a space heater over, automatically shuts itself off so that's just something a little bit new um, that a lot of people don't have because we've had space heaters in our homes for years now there's a lot of stuff out there that's very acceptable it's just about just doing a little bit of research to find out what's the safe product thank you now how samus had a question am i being heard yep yes okay uh, two questions. One, and let me ease into it my way. In COVID, we've been encouraged to wear masks, to be vaccinated, to get a booster shot, to stay away from people nearby, and yet people are coming down with COVID. So in, in essence, and I'm certainly in favor of all of those, but in, in essence, protection is not always what we assume it to be. So my question as it relates to you folks is fire sprinklers. I'm sure in the manufacture of fire sprinklers, there's 100% satisfaction, they're tested. But once they are installed in a building, can things go wrong with the installation? And presumably, once they're installed, they're never tested. So how do we know the fire sprinklers in any particular building will work when a fire rages. Uh, I actually mentioned that in the beginning when I did my presentation in a general way, saying that any type of fire uh, protection you put in place needs to be maintained. But also, as you're saying, risk is never fully gone. And I said that before too, no matter what you put in place, we can never 100% say the risk is gone. Sprinklers is one of those things. They are uh, subject to mechanical failure. They are subject to human error. They can be closed down for construction and then forgotten to be reopened. They could be mechanically break down. So just because a building has sprinklers doesn't mean it's perfect. So yes, we agree with you on that. And we approach everything along those lines. Also, sprinkler buildings, they do save lives. They do reduce um, fire deaths and fire damage. But they also create a lot of smoke. They create um, carbon monoxide from the unburned materials. So that is something else that you have to take into account also. But they do help people get out of their residences. It gives them time. It saves them time. It tries to, if it can't extinguish the fire, contain it until we can finish it off. So these things are all, so as a system, yes, sprinklers, automatic alarms, 
anything you put in is always subject to some type of mechanical failure, human error, or tampering. But on the high percentage, like you're saying with COVID, we try and reduce the risk as much as possible. And each thing you add, that helps to reduce the risk. The second question. Uh, the next speaker is Michelle Brown. Hi, can you hear me? This is Michelle. Yes. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you for this presentation. It's really informative. I'm sure it's going to save a lot of people. I did have a question. I'm not sure if I missed, you might have brought this up in the beginning. I was a few minutes late. Um, so a place like Greenberg Housing Authority, are those buildings and units inspected um, by the fire department? And to make sure that they're up to code or is that the housing authority's responsibility um you know just hypothetically you go and there's something not right do you like give us you know give them notice and say these need to be fixed or is that all onus on the housing authority thank you i can build on that one um the housing authority is our district and we do work with the housing authority um we inspect the common areas, so common hallways, entranceways, the exteriors of the buildings. But as uh, DC Nanko said earlier, you know, unless someone invites us into their home or to their residence, it's not a requirement of us to go and inspect that, and we won't uh, force their way. We're absolutely happy if someone wants to have an inspection, a safety inspection. We'll absolutely entertain that, and we'll go and give some recommendations if they want. Uh, but we do not inspect individual residences or apartments. It's just the common areas of the exterior of the building and uh, common hallways. Thank you, Ice. Thank you. Uh, there are no more raised hands. Great. Well, thank you. And we really appreciate this uh, very informative and, and helpful <laughs> presentation. Definitely was worth it. Um, thank you, and we'll make sure that we circulate uh, uh, copies of this so more and more people will see it during um, during the years. Thank you. Um, thank next, you very much, Paul. Great. Thank you.